I did something really silly. I sat in my glasses, so I'm literally partially blind. I can't even see George's face at the back there, so bear with me. <laughs> I didn't say that now. Um, but thank you to Tom for giving me the opportunity to open up God's Word. Um, it's a real blessing to be able to do it, and I, I really do cherish the opportunity to do it. So this afternoon, I'm going to share with you um, really what God's been sharing with me. I think that's the easiest way to do it. And it's from the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bible this morning, can you please turn to uh, Matthew chapter 6. And just, just while you're turning there, just by way of context, um, Matthew's Gospel has been in my own personal devotions. Um, I've been making my way through the, the Gospels, and I'm nearly ready to move into Mark. Uh, the reason being, I usually find myself sort of jumping in between um, books in the Bible, from book to book. But in the turn, turn of the year, I decided I'm going to stick with the Gospels and try and read them consecutively. Um, to give myself a wee bit better structure, I suppose. And whilst it's been a massive blessing doing this, um, and an encouragement, it's also been a very convicting one. <laughs> and where we find ourselves this morning, and Matthew is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the most famous sermon in the world given by the Lord Jesus himself. So no pressure for me this morning. But you're probably quite accustomed to most of the themes in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Got Questions website, uh, which I'd really encourage you to use. It's really, really useful. Um, it summarizes it in a simple sentence. It says, how to live a life that is dedicated to and pleasing to God, free from hypocrisy, full of love and grace, full of wisdom and discernment. And the last time I spoke, I shared from 1 Samuel. And whilst there are testaments apart, the same theme has come up again for me, and it's all to do with prayer. So a couple of months ago, I think it was in December, we looked at Hannah's prayer, um, but today I want to look at the Lord's prayer. You know, prayer is such an important part of the Christian life. You know, it's not optional. Don't comp comp compromise on it, if I can get my words out. Because it's absolutely essential. You know, Martin Luther says, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Mm -hmm. Prayer is the primary way for the believer in Jesus Christ to communicate our emotions and desires with God and to fellowship with him. And luckily for us, for us, we don't have to try and work out how to pray on our own. Jesus provides us with full clarity on how we are to pray, with structure, who we are to address our prayers to, how we can align our prayers with God's will uh, for provision and for help and for courage. And today I hope to walk through each line of the Lord's Prayer because I have found it extremely useful in my own private prayer life. It's one I've been whispering into the ear of little Alice at bedtime and it's a prayer that I hope sticks with her as she grows up. I'll also include a few points of how not to pray. But before we do, let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for another Sunday. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to speak to your people. Lord, I just pray that you'll prepare our hearts, Lord, to receive your word. Lord, I pray that I open my mouth, Lord, and I just pray that you'll fill it. And Lord, just pray all these things in your name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 6, and we'll go down to verse 5. And we'll probably read all the way down to verse 15. Okay. Verse 5 says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will you, your Father forgive your trespasses. And the first wee section I want to look at this morning is how not to pray. Just that wee bit of text there um, at the start of what I read. But I'm not going to spend too much time in how not to pray because I'd rather focus this morning on how the Lord tells us to pray. You know, prayer is a form of worship. It's direct access to God, the Father. And he tells us in his word to never cease making our requests and our petitions known to him. You know, but in Isaiah chapter 1, you know, we're told not to go through the, the emotions, not to treat our worship to God as just a surface level tradition um, that we want to tick off. Instead, worship should be of a broken heart and a contrite spirit before an almighty God. You know, Jesus says, don't pray just to be seen by others in order to be praised by them uh, because of how well our prayers might sound how eloquent they might sound. Don't pray empty phrases. Empty phrases oversell and underdeliver. There's no substance to them at all. Jesus isn't telling us not to pray publicly. Rather, he's telling us that he's more concerned about what our prayer life looks like from behind closed doors when no one else is around. He's more concerned about who our prayers are to. You know, are they to puff up our pride and demanding that we are to be praised by others? Or are they from a humble heart and a spirit demanding that God be praised? Jesus tells us to lay out for ourselves treasures in heaven rather than treasures on this earth. So don't be like the people in Isaiah 29, 13, where the Lord says, These people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And that's all I really want to say on that part. I want to sort of focus on how to pray because there's a lot to cover. So let's look at how we are to pray according to Jesus. So if you look again there at verse 9, Jesus says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that's the first wee thing I want to sort of home in on, is our Father. You know, Jesus gives us clarity in who we are to address our prayers to. We are addressing to God the Father. We are to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is dwelling within us. And Jesus simply calls us to address God the Father as our Father. You know, he's ours. But he could have very easily told us to address him as Alpha and Omega, the Creator, the King of Kings, or the Lord of Lords. And whilst he is all these things, Jesus instructs us to simply address him as our Father on a more intimate level. You know, when when I think of the term Father, I think of provision. I think of sacrificial love, you know, long suffering, the Father knows and wants what's best for his children. You know, there's a family relationship there, there's discipline, and ultimately there's goodness. And isn't that what God wants, that God our Father is to us this morning, if we're saved? You know, in his sacrificial love, he made provisions through the blood of his Son, his only Son, Jesus Christ, while we were st- still dead in our sins, knowing what was good for us before we knew what was good for us, so that he could purchase us with his blood with his son's blood, to call us his son or to call us daughter. You know, even as as children, as his children, he still knows that we're going to mess up. He's so long-suffering with us that the sacrificial giving of his son was enough to cover not only our past sin, but our present, and to cover also our future sin. You know, they're all taken care of. You know, just even that verse that that Mogi read this morning, you know, our record of debt is plentiful. It's so much. But it's been nailed to the cross. You know, we're forgiven this morning. And verse John 3, 1 says, reminds, reminds us of the love of the, our Heavenly Father has for us. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And then the next wee part of the verse is, hallowed be your name. It says, you know, the, the word hallowed is just another word for holy. So in other words, Jesus is saying to the Father, let your name be holy. And holiness really just means uh, that God stands alone. His name is separate and distinct, and he is separated from his creation because he is holy. 1 Samuel 2, um, verse 2 says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside him. You know, so holy, holiness means that he is without sin. You know, he has absolute moral perfection. God's holiness means that he is perfectly good because he is the standard of goodness. 
There's only one word in the Bible that is repeated three times to describe God, and that word is holy. And anyone know, who knows me, or who has sat beside me in church, knows that I'm a terrible singer. Um, I'm actually tongue deaf, and I'm not waiting for you to tell me that, no, Curtis, you are a terrific singer, because I know I'm not. And I know I'm not because I thought I was a really good singer when I was singing in the shower. Um, so I decided to record myself. This is, maybe, this is 10 years ago, by the way. And I was really excited. I was like, right, I'm going to be the next number one in the UK, the UK charts. And I listened back to myself and deleted it straight away because I'm terrible. And I even remember auditioning for the choir in primary school. You know, trauma still, still with me, with me today. Um, and I wanted to, to audition and the only way that you could get into the choir was to sing in front of everyone <laughs> in the choir and it was probably the worst experience of my life uh, I decided to sing Jesus Loves Me <laughs> um, and I sang the, the song the whole way through I started off a wee bit, a wee bit quiet but really ploughed through it at the end and got really bold um, but I was only really selected out of pity because they placed me right at the back, out of the way, from all the microphones. <laughs> but thank the Lord that he says to make a joyful noise, which, thankfully for me, doesn't necessarily mean to make a good one. You know, Revelation 4.3 gives me goosebumps um, when I read it this week. You know, it gets me excited because it talks about the angels who, because of God's glory, have to use their wings to cover their own faces because of his holiness, all the while singing without season, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's what we'll proclaim without season with them, but this time with perfect voices when we get there. Verse 10 then, if you look down again, is, says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there's a wee bit of a twofold meaning to this verse. You know, the first one is a longing for Christ's kingdom um, on his return. As Christians, that's what we should be hopeful for. That's what we should be expectant. Um, and that's what we should be looking for. And whilst I read that verse 10, that should hopefully make you feel hopeful too. And, you know, it's a hope that we long for as Christians to no longer be separated from our God. And I think sometimes, I know for me anyway, that we get caught up in the busyness of our own lives maybe placing more value on the gifts and blessings we have received rather than on the giver that give us those gifts in the first place. You know, that we are so concentrated on building our own wee kingdoms here on earth. And, you know, we forget that this is our temporal home. And I'm all too guilty of that. And you'll see Paul speaking uh, to the Corinthians. You know, he reminds us that this world is just like a tent. You know, it's a temporal home whilst we wait on the completion of our home in heaven. And verse 10 of the Lord's Prayer has been a good reminder to me that as a Christian we are to live in the hope of kingdom living that is before us in the next life. And I, I just want to read just a quick extract from Jonathan Edwards' sermon entitled Heaven is a World of Love. And he says, There dwells God the Father, who is the Father of mercies, and so the Father of love, who so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son to die for it. And there dwells the Christ, the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace and of love, who so loved the world that he shed his blood and poured out his soul unto death for men? There dwells the great uh, mediator from whom all the divine love is expressed toward men and by whom the fruits of the love of that love have been purchased and through whom they are communicated and through whom love is imparted to the hearts of all God's people. There dwells Christ in both his natures, the human and the divine, sitting on the same throne with the Father. And there dwells the Holy Spirit, the spirit of divine love in whom the very essence of God, as it were, flows out and is breathed forth in love and by whose immediate influence all holy love is shed abroad in the hearts of all the saints on earth and in heaven. That is the home for which I long, that place where the triune God forever and perfectly loves those on whom he has placed his love. You know, this is my home. This is the home of all those on whom God has placed his saving love. You know, God's kingdom is our home, and it's good that we remember that, and that we should be actively yearning and longing for God's kingdom to come. 
But the second part is it's also a longing for Christ's will in the here and now. You know, what is God's will? God's will is the advancement of his kingdom. And he's given us the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, he won't return until his last child has been redeemed. God's will is also his glorification. You know, man's chief end, our very purpose, is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You know, to glorify God in everything, we must exercise faith. We must exercise love without hypocrisy. We must deny ourselves to be filled with the Spirit and offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And God's will is a saving and the sanctification of his children as well. The Bible tells us that we receive the gift of salvation and then we are a new creation in Christ. You know, he begins this process called sanctification, which is basically a chipping away of our old self and realigning us with our new self in Christ. He is setting us apart for a special use and purpose so that we might be holy as he is holy. And he will complete that work on that day that he calls us home. And God's will will come to pass no matter what. You know, God is sovereign. No, ma no matter what we see going on in this world and how discouraging sometimes it might be to see even in our own country God being pushed out further and further, um, we know that God is in control of all things. So we don't need to be anxious or distressed. Instead, all we need to do is pray to the King of Kings who hears us. And then lastly, God's will for our lives. God tells us that we are engraven into, our names are engraven into the palm of his hands. And to be honest, there's no better place to be. You know, we often want to know what God's will uh, for our lives is, that we stress about the minor details because we don't want to stray away from it. And you know, like, Lord, show me in your word if you want me to buy this car. Or Father, has taken this job part of your will. Father, should I marry this person? Should I start a family or should I buy this house? Where will you place me? And whilst it's good and right that we seek his will in all that we do, he allows us to make choices and decisions. And if the answer to all those questions that you're praying for in your life does not lead you into sin, God tells us to honour him in our decision and he'll honour us. You know, how assuring is it to know that God has a will for our lives? We're here for a purpose. Verse 11 then says, Give us this day our daily bread. You know, Jesus tells us to depend on God, the Father, for our daily bread. And there's a wee bit of um, linking here between the Old and the New Testament. You know, this should make us sort of think of the man in the wilderness. And just like I was saying, this links back to the first line of the Lord's Prayer, in which the, the, the name Father alludes to the provision he has for his children. And I think the use of the word bread to describe our needs is quite interesting. You know, you'll remember in the Old Testament, as the Israelites traveled through the wilderness, they began to grumble against the Lord because of their hunger. They actually even wished that they could return to their old slave master because at least they had something to eat. But God in his mercy provided and sent down bread from heaven. But he had conditions for his people. He told them to only collect enough for the day because if they took too much, it would breed worms and rot away in the morning. You know, and this is simply to test them to see if they actually trust it in the Lord to provide each day. And the Lord did provide for 40 years. God promises to do the same for us. If you look with me at Matthew 6, if you go down to verse 25 and 27, he says, therefore, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, they neither sorrow nor they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And then look down again, then to verse thirty-one. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, "What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear?" For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, getting from that, our main priority, above even food and drink and clothing, is to seek first the kingdom of God over all these things. 
and then he'll make provision for us physically and spiritually. The next point then that this sort of bread that he gives us alludes to is that he feeds us spiritually with his word. You know, we're told to meditate on the word of God. In other words, we're to chew on it, to really break it down so that we can nourish our souls with its nutrients. You know, I've benefited with this over the years, and I'm sure many of you in here have as well this morning, that when we find ourselves maybe in times of trouble, maybe a temptation or suffering, a verse just happens to pop into our heads and in our minds that in turn feeds our trust in God. And John Milken um, sums up this idea of the Bible study as our daily bread really well. It says, for years, I viewed my interaction with the Bible as a debit account. I had a need, so I went to the Bible to withdraw an answer. But we do so much better to view our interaction with the Bible as a savings account. I stretch my understanding daily. I deposit what I glean, and I patiently wait for it to accumulate in value, knowing that one day I will need to draw on it. The next one then is we are to feast on him. In John's Gospel, John tells us, that he is the bread of life. You know, we're, we're f- physical bread perishes and never totally satisfies us. He is spiritual bread that never perishes and satisfies us completely and wholly. Above all, he tells us time and time again to seek first the kingdom of God and then our hunger for righteousness in the sight of God will be satisfied. And then the next point is daily prayer in terms of uh, daily bread. You know, it's a, it's a call that prayers aren't just for the end of the week. They're not for Sunday morning. They're not for certain days. You know, they're for every day. It's a call for daily prayer. You know, just as the Israelites were dependent on God for their daily bread in the wilderness on their journey to the promised land, so we are to be dependent on God for our daily needs as we journey in the wilderness of this world until we make it to the promised land. And then in verse 12 of our text, Jesus says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You know, debt in this case is just another word for sin. And every human being has accumulated debt against God. We are both born in and shaped in iniquity. And when we really think about what Jesus is telling his disciples, it really is amazing. You know, Jesus is telling his people to ask God for forgiveness for their sin while knowing that forgiveness will only be found through the shedding of his own blood. Jesus was foretelling his own death and that because of his perfect sacrifice for our sin, we can also show forgiveness to those sins against us. You know, there's a famous quote uh, by C.S. Lewis. It says, to be a Christian means forgiving the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Likewise, D.A. Carson explains that the debt is not simply that we have been forgiven and therefore we ought to forgive but God himself in Christ has forgiven us and therefore our debt is incalculable. No matter how much wretched evil has been done against us, it is little compared with the offence that we have thrown in the face of God. Yet God in Christ has forgiven us. If we know anything of the release of this forgiveness, if we have glimpsed anything of the magnitude of the debt that we owe to God, our forgiveness of others will not seem to be such a large leap. You know, the Christian life should be marked with confession, repentance, and forgiveness. In the same way that we love because he first loved us, so then it's true that we can forgive because he first forgave us. And the book of Micah, chapter 7, verse 19, says that God casts all our sin into the depths of the sea. And I remember hearing a quote, I just can't remember who it was by, but he says that God has thrown our sin into the sea for for. for God has thrown our sin into the sea of forgetfulness and has posted a sign saying no fishing allowed. True forgiveness is not just cancelling the debts, but forgetting it altogether. It's dealt with, it's cast into the sea. So Christian here today, know that you're, as you stand in Christ, you are forgiven. Verse 13 then says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, if we are to lead ourselves in this world, we can do nothing but lead ourselves out into sin. This would ultimately lead us into death and separation from God. And Jesus tells us to pray this because he knows that already. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. 
again another another calling to surrender to his way, not ours, and not our own, because he his way is far far better. He has freed us from the old taskmaster of bondage and sin, and he promises as the good shepherd to lead us away from temptation, away from sin, and the end of his righteousness. You know, just listen to Psalm 23. You don't have to turn to it, but it says, it says this about the Lord's leading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, the good shepherd leads us away from a work in sin to a rest in him. And Garrett Kell, a, a, f- a famous American preacher, says this on temptation, which I find really helpful. He says, when you're tempted today, remember the last day. Make decisions today that you'll be grateful for 10,000 years from now. With each passing moment, we draw near to um, that day when we will be saved to sin no more. Until then, read often of heaven and ask God to, to make you home sick for that everlasting city where the pure in heart will see him at last. You know, we all struggle with temptation. We're all tempted by sin regularly. But Jesus has defeated sin on the cross once and for all. He calls us to resist the devil and he will flee from you. He always gives us a way of escape to run to him. And just as I can conclude, because our time's gone, let me conclude with a benediction from the Lord's Prayer. You know, it's a beautiful reminder for us all this morning. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.